similar things on them. So some of the things that came up over and over, honesty, the ability to delegate, good communication skills, confidence, commitment, a positive attitude, creativity, the ability to inspire others, empathy, accountability, enthusiasm, focus and drive, responsibility, integrity, a passion for the work, the ability to make decisions, and the ability to empower others. There were more things on the list, and some of my favorites included the ability to stay calm and in control, especially when everyone around you is wondering whether you've made the right decision or it was a mistake to commit to a particular course of action. That's a real talent, isn't it? And when everyone's going, wait, what are we doing? I'm not so sure. Another one was courageous patience, which is important for that time between when a decision has been made and that uncertainty when no one knows if the effort will succeed. I also liked that some lists included having a good sense of humor, good judgment, the ability to embrace failures and manage setbacks. We learn more sometimes from where we fail than what we did well. So the ability to embrace those and bringing out the best in other people. And finally, way down the list, and it's not on a whole lot of lists, is humility. But this last one seems to be at the top of Jesus's list as he's working to prepare his disciples for the time when they're going to need to lead because he will no longer be with them. James and John don't seem to get this part yet. They tell him that they want him to do for them whatever they ask of him. That sounds pretty presumptuous, doesn't it? To tell Jesus, I'm going to tell you what to do. In some ways, it sounds like what little kids would do when they know their parents are going to say no to something. So they say, promise me that you will say yes to whatever I'm going to ask you, hoping that the parent's just going to slide by this important question. But Jesus knows the question to ask. He says, what is it that you want me to do for you? And again, you almost gasp when you read this at the audacity of what they say. They want to be promised that they're going to sit at his left and his right hand, the seats of honor, when he is in his glory. Every time I read it, I feel shocked. Like they really asked him that, and I feel a little bit embarrassed for them. Like they would ask such a question and not really see how self-serving that sounds. Hey, we want to be the two that get to sit on your right and your left, and how far away they are from really understanding what he's talking about. But then I have to realize, if I'm honest, that I'm not so different from they are. How many of my prayers are about telling God what I think should happen, rather than about asking God what God wants me to do? Maybe my prayers aren't exactly saying, let me sit in the seats of glory, but, and I do believe that God wants us to ask for what we want. But if I'm honest, I suspect that a whole lot more of my prayers have sounded like I'm telling God what to do rather than asking God what I should be doing. Jesus tells them they don't know what they're asking, and they don't. They really don't. Later, he's going to ask God to forgive the very people that are killing him because they don't know what they are doing. He has an amazing capacity to forgive our sins and especially perhaps the ones where we don't really understand what's going on. We have a legal system that says ignorance of the law is no excuse. But Jesus seems to be saying ignorance of the law is cause for forgiveness. But that doesn't mean that we can just get away with anything and that bad behavior is ignored. There are consequences for everything we do. Even though Jesus tells them that they don't know what they're asking, he asks them then, are you able to drink this cup that I drink and be baptized with this baptism that I'm going to have? And they confidently answer, we are able. 
they have no clue what he's talking about, that this is not a pleasant cup to drink. This is not just a gentle sprinkle of water. So he tells them, okay, you will be baptized like I am. You will drink that cup like I do. And they don't understand that this is really not the best news for them. Later, it might be great news, but they are going to go through some tough times. The really amazing thing about this story is right before the part that we read, Jesus has just told them for the third time that he's going to die. He said, see, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit upon him and flog him and kill him. He's just said that. It doesn't get much clearer than that. And immediately, the next thing that happens is John and James say, grant us to sit on your right hand and one on your left in glory. It just sounds so strange, so clueless that they could have heard what he said and then say that. And you know who does end up on Jesus' right and left before too long? The two criminals who were crucified next to him. But then you have to wonder, do they really misunderstand? Is it possible that James and John did understand that this journey they are on is going to lead Jesus to his death? And maybe theirs as well. Charles Campbell suggests that fear leads us to want to secure things for ourselves. If we're afraid that other people are trying to hurt us, we may want to strike out at them first. If we fear that others are going to take things from us, we may want to make sure they never get close to it in the first place. Sometimes it's silly little things. I don't know how many of you remember, probably 20 years ago, there was a toilet paper shortage. And I think it got caused by people saying there's going to be a toilet paper shortage. So everybody started hoarding toilet paper. You know, we want to make sure we've got ours when we feel threatened by something. So maybe James and John aren't as clueless as we think. If you were afraid that you might be going to die with Jesus, maybe you would want to be sure that you secured your place in the afterlife too. Well, it's not going to be long in Mark's gospel before the disciples eat the Last Supper together with Jesus. It's there that he tells them that the cup which they share is the blood of the new covenant which is poured out for many. It's not a cup that most of us would want to claim if it was our blood that was being poured out for that cup. But you know, we do claim that cup every time we take communion. And our baptismal vows promise, we promise to renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, to reject the evil powers of the world, to accept the freedom and the power that God gives us to resist evil, injustice, and oppression wherever they present themselves. We confirm in those vows that we confess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We put our whole trust in his grace, and we promise to serve him as Lord in union with the church. Like James and John, I think a lot of times when we are taking communion or remembering our baptism, we don't actually fully think through what it is we're saying. And these things are kind of mysteries. We may never really fully understand them. But when we are asked, do you believe these things? Will you do these things? We, like they, say we are able. It's not volunteering for a path that leads to safety and security when we say we want to follow Jesus. We say we're going to stand firmly against evil, impression, and injustice, no matter what. And sometimes those things can be brutal. Campbell suggests that perhaps Jesus is saying to them, all right then, you're not always going to be driven by your fears and your need for security, which is what maybe they were asking for really then. Rather, Campbell says you'll be empowered to take up your cross 
and follow me, you will be faithful disciples to the very end. The other disciples are understandably not thrilled to hear that James and John have been jockeying for the best seats in the heavenly house. It makes them angry. How dare you? How dare you try to worm your way in ahead of us? So Jesus, as I said to the kids, points out to them that the way of the world is that rulers tend to rule by might, by strength. Whoever has the most military units, whoever has the most money, who's ever bigger, those are the ones that get to rule in the world. And they are often taking that to rule as tyrants. But that's not the way he says it's going to be for those who follow Jesus. Along with the honesty and the integrity and the vision casting and all those other things that are on the lists of what makes good leaders, humility is to be near the top, according to Jesus. Whoever wishes to become great in his system of doing things must serve the others. Whoever wishes to be first, he says, must be a slave to all. Because Jesus himself, who we say deserves all honor, glory, and praise, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Well, there are lots of ways that we can and do serve others in our community and all across the world. Today, as you know, is Bread for the World Sunday, which offers us the opportunity to be advocating for those people who don't have enough to eat. As I mentioned, it says in your bulletin that one in eight families in the U.S. struggle to get enough to eat, but here in our county, 20.6% of children live in food insecure households. The same set of data also says that 43.1% of the students in this county qualify for free or reduced price school meals because they might not have enough to eat otherwise. 43%. Without those meals, there would be a lot more hungry kids. We saw them being delivered when the Boys and Girls Club met here this summer. There was a big truck that drove up with food for those kids because they tend to be kids that get the free or reduced priced meals at when school's in session. So this summer, they got that food through the Boys and Girls Club. Without them, so many more would be hungry. And hungry kids, as we know, tend not to do as well in school because it's hard to think when you're really hungry. Sometimes it's very easier to just turn our head and ignore the needs of people around us. But Jesus encourages the disciple to pay attention to what's going on around them, to really look at the people they meet, to really look at them and understand what's happening in their lives, and then to set aside some of their own priorities for the sake of serving others because that's what it means to follow him. May we be bold enough to do just that. Amen.